Hello friends, good afternoon. Hope you are having a nice day. So welcome to the Hindu News Analysis. Today is 14th of May 2018. The link to the PPT presented below is available. Say about me, my name is Saga B. Ashwat. I'm a tutor at Shikshaya's Academy. I'm a faculty for psychology, Indian economy and ethics. So, as usual, the excellence is a continuous process and not an accident. This was said by APJ Abdul Kalam. So, you have to be on a steadfast path in order to be excellent in the endeavors you want to you know, go about. And it cannot be just an accident. It cannot be out of the blue. Right? On that serious note and a positive note, we'll start with our analysis. So we'll hit the editorial first and then now we'll move to the rest of the news items later on. See the first piece in the page 8 is the editorial collective assertion. This is about uh, uh, Justice you know, Thomas and uh, there was this problem of, uh, uh, sorry, Justice Joseph, uh, there was this problem of uh, him being appointed and the government not accepting his recommendation by the uh, Supreme Court Collegium. So you had this problem. So this has been discussed a lot many times uh, by me and also uh, it has been in use for quite a time now. So we'll be skipping this part. However, when uh, Justice Joseph does get appointed, it will be in news again and I will deal with in detail again. The second one is about Hezbollah's grip. So this is about Lebanon elections, parliamentary elections. So things have changed here. So there are intricate details about it and how does it impact the geopolitics of Middle East region is something we will be looking into. And then you have the changing terms of endearment. So this is about how the UP politics are uh, uh, changing with the, the Dalit and the Hindutva conflict going on there. So there is a, a wide chasm drawn uh, or there is a, a wide chasm uh, which has appeared in the recent years and also in the recent months uh, whereby the elections are uh, decided on the basis of caste politics. So this is something uh, which is completely political in nature and uh, how the political future of, of UP is going to be and uh, this has spread its tentacles, uh, the, uh, this very idea of chasm between uh, the divide between uh, the uh, Dalits and uh, the Hindutva ideology has spread across the country. So this will not be going into uh, because it is mostly political in nature. And this one is an open letter to finance ministers. Uh, this is about uh, the southern states finance ministers coming together and uh, them expressing uh, their you know, concerns about uh, the problems they have with the 15th Finance Commission and how it has wider implications for the federal structure as a whole, right? So it goes beyond just the you know, selection of years, uh, census years uh, for uh, you know, uh, awarding the devolution of taxes or devolving the taxes. So it goes beyond that. More questions ought to be answered with this regard. So we'll be looking into that aspect here. Okay, and then you have Kerala's development paradox here. Uh, it's mostly about the state issue and uh, not much is to be looked into. All right, and then we have trust in the time of polls. This is uh, something which the editor writes often. Uh, it is mostly directed to uh, the media personnel. And then you have Wakib Chinna's portrait. Uh, this is a controversy in AMU and uh, uh, people see that uh, it's not about Jinnah and uh, it's more about uh, the politics of majority Indian government. So we'll not be delving deeper into this aspect as well. Uh, it's not required from the exam perspective. Right. Uh, it is this one, an ode to the women in Mahabharata. So this is something which is uh, uh, religious and uh, uh, Puranic, right? Uh, we can say Puranic, uh, it's a Purana. So there's no need to go into these details as well, right? So we'll take up the first 
article, an open letter to finance ministers. So what is it calling for? It calls for the letter calls for uh, setting aside the political alignments or uh, uh, the political uh, background of various political leaders and uh, to defend the fiscal rights of the states. It's just that, you know, the article seeks uh, the support from various finance ministers of southern states and also other states which are on the losing side because of the 15th Finance Commission uh, terms of reference to come together and set aside their political differences. So this so happens why because uh, you have uh, certain states which are ruled by BJP or its allies and uh, these states also are you know, supposedly to lose if the 15th Finance Commission gives recommendations on the lines of the terms of reference. So that would be problematic for those states as well. So the uh, pitch made in this article is that you have to set these differences aside and uh, come together to defend the fiscal rights of the states. The state finance ministers initially had met in uh, Tiruvannathapuram, Kerala and later they met at Amravati in Andhra Pradesh and the topic of concern uh, was uh, mostly uh, the implications of the terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission. So. You know, the terms of reference for the 15th Finance Commission were set by the union government. So there is this problem. What are these specific concerns and uh, what does the letter point to uh, when it says it has other implications as well? So the terms of reference, the article says, challenges the very federal values which are enshrined in our, in our constitution and it infringes on the fiscal autonomy of the state governments. So that's what the article says. How does it infringe and how does it question the federal values? For one, there is a change in the population base here, uh, say from 1971 to 2011, which would in fact affect not only the southern states, but also the states which have done well when it, re uh, when it comes to reduction in population. So this is like you are being penalized, the states which have performed well in implementing the uh, national population policy are being penalized. So reduction in the share of taxes of the states from 42%, this is the second aspect, from the 42% that was awarded by 14th Finance Commission, uh, reviewing such an award is completely unprecedented. It's like you know, you have the uh, finance commissions giving the recommendations and uh, five years pass on. After that, uh, you know, a new finance commission uh, gives the recommendations. And there is no way a government has earlier asked the present finance commission to review the recommendations of the previous finance commission. This is something which is unprecedented. And moreover, this 42% which the government talks of is not much of a hike, so as to speak. So the 13th Finance Commission had awarded 32% and the 14th made it 42%. That's a 10% jump uh, to the state's kitty. But when you look at it closely, what can be seen is the 32% was for just the non-plan revenue expenditure. The later one, that is your 42%, is for the total revenue expenditure. As you can remember, probably, in the budget part, you have two accounts, the revenue account and the capital account, right? In the revenue, you have revenue receipts and the revenue expenditure. In revenue expenditure, you have plan expenditure and the non-plan expenditure, right? So the earlier award was only for the non-plan expenditure part. The present one, that is 42%, is for the total revenue expenditure, which includes plan as well as non-plan revenue expenditure. However, for now, what we can say is there are no plans as such. So hence, all you get is only 42%. Earlier, states used to get 32% plus the plan expenditure as well. That is, you know, plan revenue expenditure was also, you know, provided for by the union government, at least in part, right? So that was uh, under the head called grants to states. So what you can do is you can uh, go through the NCRT book uh, to get the details of uh, this classification of expenditures. It's still there in the NCRT class 12 macroeconomics textbook, right? Next, the government of India has increased our share of 
centrally sponsored scheme and we say our because this is an article which are uh, written by you know some a person our host from a southern state uh, he says our share of centrally sponsored schemes so that overall devolution as a share of gdp has remained more or less the same so that is to say the centrally sponsored schemes are the ones which are run by state the center gives the money right earlier it was like most of this finance came from central government and a part of it was financed by the state government now it is like even the state governments contribute a lot to these schemes given the scenario not much not much of state's revenues are left for its own programs so that's what this pointer says and next the government of india has said that it will be undue burden on uh, the center because of the goods and services tax however uh, in reality the goods and services tax has worsened the vertical devolution due to 50 50 sharing of taxes right 50s to 50 sharing of taxes how is this possible this is more like uh, you have uh, the vertical devolution is like across the government starting from the high level of government that is the government of india then the state governments and then you have the local self governments so what goods and services tax has done is that earlier the central government was obligated to share its taxes with the state government so some taxes were to be shared with the uh, state government you know as a whole some uh, taxes were to be retained with the center so overall when you look at it the state seems to get a you know lot of revenues by the way of devolution but now because of the gst the taxes included under gst on a basis of 50 is to 50 the states are you know realizing less of revenue or devolution a devolution amount the idea of federalism ensures that every citizen of india is uh, provided comparable public services that is all you know the citizens of india are supposed to be uh, getting the public services almost equally and they are taxed almost equally based on their income it is for this very purpose there was a provision made that a uh, uh, revenue deficit grant must be given to some states which are not doing well what the government has said now is this will be under review the revenue deficit grant will be under review so this is something uh, which is uh, not good why because the government may as well decide to remove this revenue deficit grant as a whole so that would not be a good thing for the states going forward <clears throat> the terms of reference also want to curtail the borrowing power of the states of uh, you know from the present 3% of uh, gsdp to 1.7 if the fiscal responsibility frbm that is frbm review committee headed by uh, nk singh uh, singh's recommendations are accepted by the central government so it was only during the 14th finance commission only in the 14th finance commission that uh, states were given you know the right to borrow of uh, till it reached a uh, 3% of gsdp to or uh, see that its fiscal deficit is met but now it is saying it will be brought down to just 1.7% so that's like an incursion into the fiscal space of the states the next thing it talks about is incentivizing nine items the tvo talks about incentivizing just nine items and also there are a lot of conditional grants the foreign finance commission had directed in fact that uh, you know there should be no discretionary element at all when it comes to the grants given to the states by the uh, you know finance commission or by the central government but now the new finance commission that is a 15th finance commission would be looking into whether to in- incentivize certain programs or certain uh, you know conditions be imposed if grants are to be given to these states right so what is this finance commission all about finance commission is a constitutionally mandated body which is established under article 280 so it is established every 5 years once by the president and uh, the finance commission has the uh, has the rule to formulate 
uh, come up with a formula for distributing the net tax proceeds up between the center and the states as well as uh, it also you know gives recommendations as to uh, how much money or finances ought to flow to the local bodies uh, the 15th finance commission recommendations will to, uh, will come into effect from uh, 1st of april 2020 and it will last till uh, 31st of march 2025 so who will be heading this committee? N. K. Singh will be heading this committee. He is our former bureaucrat and uh, ex-MP. He will be the chairman. And uh, along with him, there will be two permanent and uh, two non-permanent members as well. Right? The next article, this is an editorial piece. Hezbollah's grip. So where is, uh, this is about Lebanon. You find Lebanon here. Right? So it borders Israel and Syria it is not touching Jordan and you have the Mediterranean Sea here right this is Mediterranean Sea and uh, this is the Middle East map it's quite important that you uh, have a closer look at this map right which country borders which other country why because this area is quite in news for various reasons Syria is in news Iraq is in news and then Saudi Arabia has been in news Israel is in news, right? So, it's your old news, Iran has been in news. Uh, given that all these are in news, it's important that you go through this once, right? So, why was this in news? Uh, that is, Hezbollah's grave. What does it talk about? There were parliamentary elections held recently, and uh, the results have not been uh, promising for uh, the ruling party or uh, the prime minister. The prime minister here is Mr. Hariri. And uh, he remains the PM, but uh, he has suffered a setback in that uh, he has ceded some ground to Hezbollah. So, what led to this, you know, uh, setback, uh, which PM Hariri, you know, uh, just saw? The problem was that uh, he was not able to tackle a host of uh, administrative and regional challenges. He has a lot of challenges to face, and he was not able to. Uh, you know, manage them properly. Owing to which, uh, there were protests in Beirut and uh, elsewhere across Lebanon for various reasons. One was lack of administrative and regional, you know, uh, tackling of regional challenges. Secondly, uh, you had the breakdown of waste management, acute power shortages everywhere, economy not doing well. And uh, there was this refugee problem of Syrians, see here, Syrians flowing into Lebanon, right? Syrian refugees flowing into Lebanon for, uh, for the past seven years. So what is this Hezbollah all about? It is a, you know, most powerful Shia movement uh, that has uh, been designated as a terrorist organization by both US and Israel. So it has its base in Lebanon. It is also involved in the Syrian war right uh, it is fighting for the assad regime against the west and uh, also the rebel group right the rebel groups the west and uh, saudi arabia are on one side on the other hand hezbollah iran and uh, the president assad are on the other side right so the political class is largely divided into two blocks Iran allied Shia bloc uh, led by Hezbollah uh, so it has joined the Christian parties it was one of the you know uh, plank on which uh, the PM Hariri campaigned saying that uh, you know uh, Hezbollah was in cohorts with uh, uh, Christian parties and uh, you have on the opposite side the Sunni bloc which is led by Mr. Hariri it has close ties with Ar Saudi Arabia and West as I just mentioned here so how does a leader get to stay the prime minister even when he has lost sufficient ground so in fact he does not enjoy the majority in the parliament yet he remains you know the prime minister this is because you have a unique system in lebanon where the prime minister must be a sunni the president must be a christian and the parliament speaker must be a shiite so being the leader of the largest Sunni bloc, Mr. Hariri could retain his job as the Prime Minister despite the electoral setback. 
But when it comes to Hezbollah and its allies, have a greater say in the government formation from now on because uh, they have you know, won a large number of seats here. So Hezbollah has now has the power to stall the government measures that would target uh, the, you know, Iran or uh, the Assad regime. So it has the power to stall such government measures. In fact, Mr. Hariri's hands are tied. That's what we can say. So he is in a tight spot now. So even the Saudis are not happy with his inability to reign in Hezbollah. So. In the coming months, we could see a lot of fireworks, you know, uh, I mean, just say a lot of, uh, you know, divides uh, which are going to appear uh, within the government as well. And uh, things are going to get murkier at this place probably. Right. So th that was about uh, the editorial part and uh, the other things. And now, in other news, we have issues related to the Karnataka election, not important, and this one is something which is important. So 40 dead as squall and storms wreak havoc, uh, so this is across UP, uh, National Capital Region, Andhra Pradesh, right, and West Bengal. <coughs> So what's important for us is that what is a squall and what is a uh, storm, right? Squall is nothing but uh, powerful gusty winds which flew, uh, which uh, you know, which are present during the storms. So what are storms? So how are they produced? Uh, they are produced by cumulonimbus clouds, right? Uh, they produce gusty winds, of course, and there would be heavy rain and sometimes it would also lead to the formation of hail. So what is required is, uh, you know, when you have unstable air that is relatively warm and uh, close to the ground level. So this warm air rises rapidly to the top and uh, it condenses rapidly and uh, this would cause, you know, winds to flow in circular motion and uh, this would lead to uh, a storm-like storm situation and uh, you have uh, thunderstorms, right? And uh, also uh, there would be gusty winds, as I said, it is called squall. So this has led to 40 deaths, right? And then you have don't get into the dust trouble, right? So this is what the Supreme Court says. So what is this about? This is a 20-year-old case, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has now held that uh, it is clear that in 1972 Act, right, the 1972 Act clearly mentions, the 1972 Act clearly mentions that tusks do belong to the forest and uh, because they belong to forests, they, it is the property of forests, it is the property of Government of India and uh, even in the case of captive elephants, the turs would be, you know, the property of the government itself. So you cannot trade the turs, you cannot trade ivory. Yes, with the captive elephants, you can hold on to the turs, but you cannot trade them, right? This was a question which was raised uh, long back, in fact, uh, 20 years ago, as I said. The problem was that uh, there was a law in Kerala. Right, uh, the Kerala law of 1961, uh, which uh, did mention that uh, uh, the tars were excluded from uh, the forest property. So, the law implicitly uh, gave the permission to trade tars, but that is not so according to the Supreme Court judgment now, which holds that all that property belongs to the government of India. Right. Next. On this page, you have Domestic Violence Act for Divorced Women too. So the Domestic Violence Act so far covered uh, only the you know married women. So this is an act against uh, the abuse of uh, women in households. So the Domestic Violence Act has now been expanded, right, to all women man women relationships. That's what the SC says. So divorced women were uh, left out of the definition. The Supreme Court has now said that they too are included in this, you know, Domestic Violence Act. 
and then you have 111 jets at 70,000 crore Air India deal under ED lens enforcement directed that is so what is this about so this is about uh, a deal uh, which did happen during the previous regime that is the uh, UPA regime uh, where 111 jets were brought at 70,000 crore rupees uh, but what was the problem the problem was that uh, you know in most cases uh, the ED has found uh, that uh, uh, certain schedules as well as a running of flights along certain routes were uh, not according to the business model or so as to say uh, with not the intention to make profits uh, they were succumbed uh, for uh, the private players the profit making routes were succumbed for the you know private players so that is the accusation and also there is uh, something wrong with the deals uh, when it comes to acquisition of these 111 jets. So this is being looked into, probably it is going to uh, blow out of proportions and uh, this might as well dent uh, the political opposition of the government that is the Congress party in all likelihood, right? And then you have a tight trip walk over China for PM. So there is, uh, there will be a Shangri-La dialogue, uh, which is a, a dialogue on strategic and defense issues, right? It is going to be held uh, in uh, Singapore uh, uh, in the coming future. That, that is, uh, uh, it is going to be probably in the next week or so. So when this does happen, uh, Prime Minister Modi might have to walk a, a tightrope. Why is it so? Because on the one hand, he has to balance his Asia-Pacific, uh, you know, sort of allies or friends. You have uh, Japan, Australia, US, uh, with whom he has a, a very good relationship. On the other hand, he has to balance China, right, uh, with whom only now things are getting better, right. So when the Shangri-La dialogue does take place, we have to see how the PM responds or what the PM says there. Right, and then you have Israel making a green propellant, right? So, so what is this about? So, the liquid propellant which uh, the uh, Israel was using was in fact uh, um, not pollution free. It did cause uh, sort of uh, a lot of pollution. In its place, uh, the Israel. Uh, has uh, developed an environmental friendly uh, propellant to uh, power satellites and spacecraft. So the effort is to uh, replace the conventional hydrazine rocket fuel uh, which is very uh, toxic and uh, it is carcinogenic that is it might ca cause cancer. And uh, initial tests uh, by uh, Liquid Propulsion uh, System Center LPSC have shown uh, some promising results and uh, the new fuel which we are talking about is hydroxyl ammonium nitrate right so due to its high performance characteristics uh, hydrazine has dominated the space industry for over six decades now uh, despite having the uh, hazardous effects it continued to be in use so the HEN is an in-house formulation it consists of ammonium nitrate uh, then you have uh, methanol and water. So the methanol was added to uh, reduce the combustion instability. Uh, Yen, that is your ammonium nitrate, was uh, due to the capacity to control the burn rate and uh, it lowers the freezing point of the propellant, right? So this is something which is developed in-house, so it becomes important. So what is HAN, why it is uh, better than your uh, uh, hydrazine. So uh, these are the things uh, which can be asked in your prelims examination, right? Next, uh, you have okay. You know, you don't have anything in this page, right? Nothing important as such. And then uh, you have. Government regulators, well, shell firm definition. What is this about? 
the government is finding it difficult uh, to you know uh, put behind bars those people who are responsible for starting the shell farms and uh, uh, involving themselves in you know uh, in activities which are disastrous for the country where probably uh, they are rooting the money for uh, illegal activities maybe for terrorism as well so the shell firms definition is rather ambiguous the one which we have now because we have an ambiguous definition the law enforcement agencies are not able to put these behi people behind the bus in this regard the government regulators have uh, come up with a definition the definition now uh, goes very much uh, on the lines of OECD definition, so Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So the definition uh, just says that uh, all these firms are, of which are not operating, uh, which does not have operational presence and uh, uh, you know which are not uh, you know, registered with the government or otherwise. So if they are not operating then it would be considered a shell form. So this is the definition in crux, right? You can go through the definition, it's given here, right? Next you have, uh, uh, this one is consumer rights, still a gray area in insolvency and bankruptcy code. So you can go through it, it's easy to understand, all right? And then finally, you have an inch forward but miles to go. So all this, a single reading would be sufficient but here is what you need to go through the low down on recent OALP so what is OALP open acreage licensing policy and then how is it different from the uh, you know NELP which was present earlier new exploration license policy so the difference is that the earlier policy what it used to do is the firms which intended to explore were allo allocated the blocks not on the basis of that desire, right? So there will be a bidding process for exploration. So the government selects the blocks and it will be put for up for bidding. But now what happens is the Firm which wants to start the exploration selects a piece of land where it wants to do the exploration and only that block will be up for bidding right so this is somewhat uh, uh, which is revolutionary where you know the needs of the firms exploration firms are paid heed to and uh, there will be more bids in this uh, in this way and also uh, it's not like it's something which is going to happen at the whims and fancies of the government it's going to be uh, a very useful uh, for the firms why because it will be out of interest they are going to come for the you know bidding process so on the basis of their own estimates they are going to select a piece of land and uh, then they are going to buy up the you know block for exploration right so there is one more thing, uh, uh, one more thing about uh, this new policy. Uh, one more thing is that of, uh, you know, when you have a block, it's not necessary for you to take separate licenses for a various, you know, uh, various stuff that you are going to, you know, uh, explore. So that is to say, you need not have a separate license for gas. Uh, exploration you need not have a separate license for shale gas exploration you need not have a separate license for oil exploration all these explorations for different stuff can happen with a single license that is a unified license right so that's what the new policy is all about right so that's it for today guys uh, thank you and uh, have a beautiful day right thank you